Thank you for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, the topic we're going to be talking about today is workplace violence and intruder response. Active threat response is another name for it. My name is Vaughn Baker and I'm with Stratagos International. Uh, sometimes we get asked what the word Stratagos means. It's the Greek word for strategy or strategies. And uh, today's topic, we're going to be talking about strategies for preparing for active threat, armed intruder response and workplace violence. So uh, that's the strategies we're going to be talking about today. One of the biggest objections we get to preparing uh, for this particular topic is uh, people don't want to prepare, their organizations don't want to prepare because they're worried they're going to scare people. And really what that shows is a fundamental misunderstanding of where fear comes from. Fear comes from having a problem without a solution. That's where fear comes from. And so if we can give people a solution to this topic, we actually reduce fear. We don't increase fear. If we don't give people solutions solution to the topic and we just talk about that it could happen, then yeah, we could increase fear. But today we're going to be talking about strategies and solutions. Uh, so that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on in the response phase today. Uh, our background as a company, Stratagos International, we were founded in 2002 primarily doing law enforcement and military tactical training is how we started uh, back in 2002. 2002-2007, we exclusively focused on tactical training for law enforcement military organizations. And uh, 2007, a major event occurred uh, across the country. Virginia Tech, an active shooter event occurred. And that really caused us to expand our focus on who it is we train on the active threat topic. And the reason for that is we had a tremendous response at Virginia Tech. Uh, Virginia Tech, we had two SWAT teams on site attempting to make entry within two minutes. That's a tremendous response. Average response time by patrol officers is usually four to nine minutes, but SWAT teams in particular, it's 45 minutes. Uh, but because of uh, Virginia Tech, there was two homicides that took place two hours prior to the main attack. That's the reason the SWAT teams were already activated and already on site, so they got there very quickly. Despite that, though, we had a tremendous loss of life. And in, within two minute response time, we had 33 lives lost, 27 wounded. So you think about that, uh, how many people lost their lives in just two minutes. That's where we really saw the need to not only train the professional first responders. When we talk about professional first responders, we're talking about uh, those folks that respond to the scene of the crisis. Fire, EMS, law enforcement folks, they respond to the scene of the crisis. We had been training them on this topic prior to 2007, but after 2007, we really saw the need to train the true first responder. Who's the true first responder? Well, you are. The people that are on scene when the crisis begins, uh, that is who is going to have the most and best opportunity to get yourself safe rather than just calling 911 and waiting. Uh, so we talk about the value of time. We, we talk about uh, the two-minute response time that happened at Virginia Tech. Two minutes does not sound like a long time until I put you under duress. In other words, if I ask you to hold your breath for two minutes, you're going to start appreciating the value of time at about the 45-second mark. So we talk about the value of time. It, two minutes does not sound like a long time, but it is a long time when we're talking about crisis. And uh, when the police are minutes away, seconds matter. So your proper or your improper response is what's going to determine success versus failure. No pressure, by the way. I said that jokingly. Uh, we talk about people in the workplace. I know we're focusing on uh, workplace organizations for this particular webinar. Uh, this is not uncommon for this phenomenon to occur and these crises to occur in the workplace. In fact, we lose between 800 and 1,000 people per year as a result of this crisis taking place in the workplace. 800 and 1,000, that's 70 a month, that's 13 a week that we're losing in the workplace. Now we don't hear about it uh, on the national news because usually unless it involves a large body count or it happens in a place that shocks the conscience, an elementary school, a place of worship, things of that nature, you won't hear about it on the national news. And most of these incidents that are occurring in the workplace are one or two or three people lose their lives. Uh, so you won't hear about it in those cases unless it's locally. You will hear about those ones locally that occur. So we talk about uh, this idea of 800,000 people losing their life in the workplace. Yeah, of course, that's, that's tragic. That's 800 to 1,000, too many losing their life in the workplace. But when we compare it to how many people actually work in the workforce, uh, we see the odds. And now businesses are where we are losing the most lives every year. About 61% of these incidents that are occurring each and every year, these active threat, active shooter incidents, uh, and many of them are occurring with edge weapons and things of that nature as well, uh, we're losing lives in the workplace at a much greater frequency than we are any other uh, domain group or any other stakeholder group. 
Uh, we think about healthcare and places of worship and schools, uh, much lower percentages than the workplace, 61%. Having said that, I don't want to scare you. Uh, it's still not likely to occur in your workplace. Now, if you do the math, 158 million people in the workforce uh, right now, currently, uh, your odds of losing your life in the work, 800 to 1,000 divided into 158 million, is about 184,000, 185,000 to one that you will lose your life a, a, while you're at work. Now, that does not mean we shouldn't prepare for this crisis because the odds are it's not going to happen. The odds are you're not going to lose your life. And in fact, if it does happen at your place of business, you could care less about those odds, 185,000 to one. Uh, it matters to you and it matters now because it's happening at your place of business. Uh, but, but we don't prepare for any crisis because it's likely to occur. It's not likely you're going to have an F4 tornado rip through your building uh, each and every day. It's not likely you're going to have a fire rip through, through the building and people lose their lives. But we still prepare for those severe weather and tornado response uh, events because, not because it's likely, but because what would the impact be if it did occur? Again, it's frequency versus impact decision making. It may not be likely, but the impact or the consequences of not preparing are too great. So that's why we prepare for these particular events. Now, when we move on to a video I want to show you now. This, this video will illustrate the value of time. This particular video was a cell phone video that was taken by a student at Virginia Tech outside of Norris Hall. Norris Hall is where most of the homicides took place. You're going to watch this video here. What I want you to do, if you can, get your cell phones out and get them ready because I want, to get, I want you to get your stopwatch ready. When you hear the first shot, I want you to start your stopwatch on your cell phone. And then the last shot, I want you to hear, I, I, I want you to stop your stopwatch and, uh, on the last shot. And then I want you to, if you can, try to count how many shots are being fired. And then we'll talk about it after we watch this video. Listen to how this shooting played out on campus. shocking video there you could hear the gunfire ring out and it, just to let you know this takes us to the scene of what happened there on the Virginia Tech campus scenes there John what are we learning so far about the shooter himself we've had various uh, witness reports uh, one eyewitness saying that the gunman was uh, a young Asian uh, who had a lot of ammunition attached to him another witness said that the gunman had an ungodly amount of ammunition on him what have you heard about him so far everything that I have heard has been unconfirmed um, listening to a police scanner earlier today, um, I did hear the, those same reports that, that it was an um, Asian, Asian uh, person. Um, whether, he was a, whether this person was a student or not, I'm not sure. I did hear that he had multiple firearms. But again, all of this, they, they haven't really released any information on the shooter yet. And at this time, everything that I have heard has been unconfirmed. And have you heard the unconfirmed report that a gunman was looking for his girlfriend and lined up students and shot them one by one, which is uh, one of the initial things we heard here? No, I actually just heard that when I was uh, uh, waiting to uh, come on the line with you from, the, I believe he was a student on the campus. That is the first uh, information that I've heard on him looking for his girlfriend and lining up students. John Harper from Fox News Radio. We'll uh, let you get on with your job there. I'm sure we'll be talking to you uh, a little later. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, you're quite welcome. Well, we do have some uh, 
video and audio footage of this shooting. Let's just play it to you now. that footage is, I think it does bring home the absolute terror. fired in that video. 26 of them were fired by the suspect. That last one you heard that was a lot louder. That was law enforcement shooting. Uh, and what happened in this particular incident is the attacker chained the door shut from the inside to prevent law enforcement from coming, coming in. So the last round you heard that was much louder. Law enforcement had to shoot the locks off in order to get in to stop the attacker. Uh, and when he became aware of law enforcement present, when he heard that shot and knew law enforcement was there, he actually shot himself and he ended his own attack uh, because he did not want to fight. We're gonna talk about that more as to why that's the case here in just a little bit. So we had 26 rounds fired by the suspect. The reason that we wanted to show you that video is that video really illustrates very effectively the value of time. And we want you to think about how many people lost their lives in less than a minute. We talk about 52 seconds. Uh, so when we look at that video, uh, that just illustrates that the importance and emphasizes the importance of you, the true first responder, preparing in advance for this unlikely but very serious event. So uh, as, uh, just glad you had a chance to watch that video. The next thing we want to talk about is how people respond physiologically and psychologically when a crisis happens. And uh, one of the uh, topics we're going to spend a little bit of time on here is this topic we call normalcy bias. This is a phenomenon that occurs in all types of crisis. Normalcy bias is this idea, and if you define it, it's the mental state of denial people enter into when facing disaster or pending danger. Uh, normalcy bias leads people to minimize, underestimate, underestimate, or even rationalize the crisis away. So what happens in normalcy bias, this phenomenon, is you and I are biased to the normal that happens each and every day. In fact, we're so biased to the normal that when the crisis occurs, we have difficulty accepting the crisis because we're so biased to the normal happening. And I'm going to give you a few examples here in just a minute. Uh, but we've got to learn to overcome this phenomenon of normalcy bias. How do we overcome normalcy bias? Well, we recognize that it's a real phenomenon that does occur. It occurs in every single active threat event. Uh, believe it or not, you, next time one of these happens, I want you to listen to the radio or the, uh, the news or the television. And I want you to listen to the witnesses being interviewed. You will hear examples of normalcy bias. So here's what we know about normalcy bias phenomenon and the challenge of overcoming it is you cannot effectively respond to a crisis that you don't accept. So we have to accept the crisis before we can respond to it. So we have to overcome that, that bias towards the normal in order to do so. So I want to give you a few examples here. Uh, this is an extreme example. This particular example happened at Wedgwood Baptist Church 1999. It was a, uh, a church on a Wednesday night that a, a, a deranged gunman entered the foyer area. The youth group were doing a celebration service that night. There were 700 youth present. 1999, a gunman entered the foyer, saw two youth sitting on a bench over to the side. He victimized those first two. He took their lives. A male staff member down a hallway saw the first two homicides take place. Despite watching these homicides, he looked at the ladies next to him in the hallway. He said, ladies, step out of the way. This guy's coming this way. He's part of the skit. So in other words, he thought this was a skit. He, he couldn't accept the crisis. He thought, there's no way this is real. This has to be a skit. The gunman walks towards him, raises his gun, 
shoots him twice, the male staff member, shoots him twice. The male staff member looks down, he sees his own blood, and guess what he tells the ladies then? Believe it or not, he told the ladies, ladies, step out of the way, he's using paintball. Uh, so even though he's been shot twice now, he still cannot accept the crisis uh, because of this phenomenon, this normalcy bias phenomenon. What happened then is the gunman then entered the sanctuary, he began to victimize people in the sanctuary, and it was reported that multiple students and youth that were in the sanctuary ran towards the gunman, waving their arms, yelling, shoot me, shoot me. And what was happening there is they wanted to be part of the skit as well. That's what they thought was happening. And so they were yelling, hey, I want to be part of the skit, shoot me, sh shoot me. So many of them were victimized and actually put themselves in danger as a uh, because of normalcy bias. So that's an extreme example, but I want to give you a couple more here. Uh, Virginia Tech, at Virginia Tech, uh, next door to Norris Hall where most of the homicides took place, there was a building that had been under construction for several months. So when the shots began to be fired by the suspect, many people delayed a proper response because of normalcy bias. They were so biased to the normal that when they heard the shots, they were like, this can't be real. That has to be construction noises that are happening at the building next door. And it delayed a proper response, and, and um, many, some people could have lost their lives as a result of it. The next one we'll talk about is the Paris attack. In 2015, 130 people lost their lives in the Paris ta uh, terrorist attack. 89 of those 130 lost their lives at the Bataclan Theater. The Bataclan Theater, there was a hard rock concert going on, and we had two gunmen that entered the theater with AK-47s and hand grenades, and then began to lob hand grenades and victimize people with AK-47s. Uh, many people delayed a proper response at this hard rock concert because they thought this was pyrotechnics that were part of the show. In other words, they were trying to substitute reality with what they were hoping. This can't be real. This has to be pyrotechnics part of the show. So they were victims of normalcy bias, and people lost their lives as a result. The next one I want to talk about is Columbine. Uh, many people know about Columbine. What you don't know is there was a teacher in the library. Her name was Patty Nielsen. Uh, she, was pres she was a teacher in the library. She heard the shots take place. She was biased to the normal. She was a victim of normalcy bias. Despite hearing the shots in the hallway, she decided she needed to go out and investigate those shots and look. She wouldn't, she, even though she heard the attack taking place, she wanted to see it. Now you may say, that's not very smart. Well, it's a very natural thing that occurs. Why? Because you and I, we make decisions primarily, absent training, based on, on sight. Uh, of our five senses, the information we gather to make a decision, about 80% of that information comes from sight. So physiologically, psychologically, she was a victim of this phenomenon, normalcy bias. Even when she went out in the hallway and she saw the shooting take place, what she told the dispatcher when she finally called 911 is she said, I thought it was a video production. So she couldn't accept the crisis because she was so biased to the normal. And it wasn't that she thought it was a video production. Really what was happening is, and people do this in crisis, is she was hoping it was a video production. And we know this about hope. Uh, hope is not a strategy when it comes to responding to crisis. So we have to uh, not have hope. We need to have a strategy. We need to have those items that we know have to get done in a quick amount of time and those tasks that get done to respond to whatever crisis uh, that we perceive is occurring. So, but we can't respond to it unless we overcome normalcy bias. Now, how do we overcome normalcy bias? Well, it's very simple. Uh, we talk about it. And just the fact that you know now that this is a real phenomenon uh, you will be able to overcome normalcy bias. And uh, in fact, other, when you talk about other, uh, other types of crisis, normalcy bias takes place, and I'll give you an, another example. Uh, if you think about back to 2004, the Indian Ocean tsunami, over 250,000 people lost their lives. Many of those people lost their lives doing what, if you had to guess? Yes, they were standing on the beach watching the tidal wave come in and they never moved. Why? Because of normalcy bias. They were so biased to the normal, they, they were telling themselves this can't be real. And you will watch videos uh, where people lost their lives standing on the beach and never moving, despite having plenty of warning and seeing the tidal wave coming for quite some distance away. And they were victims of normalcy bias as well. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is physiologically, psychologically, the benefits of training people. And so to do that, we're going to talk about two categories. The first is people that are not trained, uh, how they physiologically and psychologically respond to crisis, and people that are trained, how they physiologically and psychologically respond to crisis. And you'll see the benefits very quickly. 
First thing we see, the untrained reaction. And those people that are in the untrained category, people that have not been trained for that particular crisis, they do not respond. Untrained people cannot respond. Instead, they react. And reaction is an instinctually based uh, action that takes place. And when we talk about instincts, many people will say, oh, well, your instincts are the highest level of him performance. I will tell you that they are not. Many of those things, those reactions that we receive, uh, that we see in crisis uh, that are instinctual are not good, uh, good reactions. And uh, they're not the highest level of human performance. In fact, what we know about training is <clears throat> we train to overcome our instincts, not reinforce them. So that's why we train and we overcome those, those things that are natural uh, but wrong as far as how we react uh, for the untrained person. So uh, let's just go through this category, the untrained reaction. The first is most people in the untrained category will experience normalcy bias. After experiencing normalcy bias, that transitions into disbelief. Disbelief transitions into denial. So in these first three, three out of five steps, you notice that we haven't even accepted the crisis yet. Uh, normalcy bias, disbelief, and denial. Now finally, in the fourth step, panic is where they finally accept the crisis. Now, but because they haven't been trained, all they can do is panic. And then panic transitions into helplessness. Because they didn't know what to do, the untrained person, all they can do is panic and, and feel helpless. And, of course, fear is very prevalent in this category. Now, for the benefits of training, and why do we train people? Let's look at physiological and psychological response of people that are trained. First of all, the person that is trained will accept the crisis. They're very quickly able to overcome normalcy bias. Now that you understand it, you will be able to overcome normalcy bias. You accept the crisis. Again, you cannot effectively respond to a crisis that you do not accept. That transitions into a proactive awareness. And then proactive awareness transitions into recall. What is the trained person recalling? They're recalling those tasks that they've been trained to do uh, in, in relation to that particular crisis that they're responding to. And then recall transitions into an urgent response physiologically, psychologically. Doing the right thing too late is the wrong thing. So we have to do it quickly, do those tasks quickly on how we've been trained. And we're gonna talk about those, how to respond to this particular crisis here in just a minute. And then the last step that you see with the train category is that there's a commitment to action. They know they have to get these tasks done quick, quickly. And so now the untrained person where they focus on nothing but fear because they haven't been trained on what to do, the trained person focuses on those things that they know they have to get done quickly. And that re results in a reduction of fear, not an elimination of fear, but now instead of fear becoming the paralyzer, it now becomes the motivator. The attack came without warning as seen on this airport surveillance video obtained by TMZ. 26-year-old Esteban Santiago pulls out his pistol and opens fire. Passengers run for cover as Santiago moves out of camera range through the baggage claim section, where police say he emptied his 9mm semi-automatic handgun and then reloaded once, killing five people and injuring six more. Tonight, the question is why a man who told the FBI he was hearing voices about ISIS, thought the government had put a chip in his head, was able to keep his gun even after being hospitalized for a mental examination. The gun was taken away from him, but it was is given back after he was uh, cleared. A question put to the Broward County Sheriff, Scott Israel. Do you think he should have had that gun? Well, no. There are also questions tonight why FBI agents in Anchorage, Alaska, did not put Santiago on a no-fly list after he showed up there claiming he was hearing voices. I want to be clear, during our initial investigation, we found no ties to terrorism. But after being arrested Friday, Santiago claimed to FBI agents he actually had been in contact with ISIS online. And now, after recovering Santiago's computer from an Alaska pawn shop, FBI agents are investigating whether he created a jihadist identity for himself several years ago under the name of Ashik Hamad. Santiago's brother in Puerto Rico told ABC News the FBI should have done more sooner. The mistake was there, said Brian Santiago. They knew this for two or three months. Brian Ross now joins us on set. Brian, do we know anything about the alleged shooter and his planning process for this attack? Yes, Tom. Authorities tell ABC News tonight Santiago only made his plans to go to Fort Lauderdale a few days ago. He bought his one-way $278 ticket just last Tuesday, telling some members of his family he was going to visit a stepbrother in Fort Lauderdale. We talk about the realities of, of, of intruder response. Well, it's not just 
uh, law enforcement and leadership's uh, responsibility. Law enforcement security personnel, certainly they need to prepare in advance for this topic. Uh, it's your organization leadership, uh, your companies, uh, your leadership is responsible to train as well and train your folks. But another phrase that's not very popular nowadays is individual responsibility. After today, you will be trained on this topic and not only is it your responsibility to know how to keep yourself safe, but you want to tell the people you work with and tell the people that do not have this information on how they should respond as well, and that would include your loved ones as well. We do this through a, a combined response of both you as the organization and law enforcement and security. And we do it through three phases. The first is the education phase, which is what you're doing now, part of what you're doing now. The next would be planning, preparation, and coordination. Uh, putting a policy in place, a plan in place. And then, of course, uh, the third is implementation, the training phase, and how we're going to implement our plans and our policies. So it's three steps, uh, education, planning, coordination, preparation, and, and then the last is uh, implementation uh, when we talk about uh, preparing in advance. Now. The next thing I want to talk about is the attacker themselves. When we put together curriculum for any particular crisis, we look at it from three categories. The first is, what does the true first responder need to know to keep themselves safe? And that's really what motivated us to develop this curriculum. What is it I want my loved ones to know if they ever find themselves in a situation to keep themselves safe? The second is law enforcement and security personnel that will respond to this incident. <clears throat> what is it they need to know? That's the second perspective when we're talking about development of this curriculum. And then the third is what we're going to talk about right now, and that's what is the attacker trying to accomplish? If we can understand the attacker's goals and objectives, now based on our response and based on, on what curriculum we're putting together and what solutions we're putting together, we can put together solutions that help uh, make it very hard for the attacker to accomplish their goal. Now we can't do this unless we understand what their goal is. Uh, we know this, uh, the attacker's primary goal is they want to set the new record. What is the new record? Well, it's body count and casualties. And so that's why many of these attackers will plan these attacks days, weeks, months, even over a year in advance. And not only will they plan based on the location they're going to attack, but they'll plan by researching what is the record, uh, who set the previous record. Uh, uh, currently, the record is Las Vegas Massacre, uh, 58, 59 killed, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and uh, that's the record uh, as far as the number of people that lost their lives in Las Vegas. That's the U.S. record. Uh, the record worldwide, uh, I guess you could say, was the Paris attack or uh, the Norway attack uh, where it was an, on an island where many people lost their lives, over 70 lost their lives in that particular attack. Uh, the attacker, they plan all phases of the attack except their escape strategy. Why? Because this is their escape strategy. Typically, they end their attack uh, the traditional attacker will end their attack by committing suicide. Uh, we see these attacks committed by two, pe two types of attackers. The first is the traditional type attacker, which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about here. And then the second is the ideological attackers, those that are motivated by political, socioeconomic, religious, extremist, things of that nature. Uh, most of the attacks occurring in the U.S. are traditional attackers. That's why we're going to spend most of our time talking about that. They very rarely plan, even though they spend a lot of time planning the attack, they very, very rarely plan the escape. Uh, they have a hatred, hatred of everyone, including themselves, and especially themselves. And they have a long list of personal failures. Not only do they have a long list of personal failures, but they also have a very difficult time accepting any responsibility for those failures. They're always blaming others for their failures. And many times, the failure they've experienced in life, they blame society as a whole, or their coworkers or um, siblings or parents um, many, uh, in, in some cases. So uh, we also need to understand their worldview. These attackers, traditional attackers, what is their worldview? Their worldview is this. They see everybody in the world as in one of two categories. And to them, they're either in the victim category or they're in the victimizer category. Now the victim category to them is the category of failure and that's the category they've lived in their whole life. And that's why they've perceived themselves as a failure, long list of personal failures. They see the victimizer category as the category of success. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to transition from the failure category, the victim, victim category, to the victimizer category, the category they perceive as success. And that's the nature of their act. That's why they pick a location where they feel like they're going to be successful as far as victimize, victimizing others. 
And uh, the reason for that, because they've lived in that victimizer or the, the victim category their entire life, they're behaviorally preconditioned to be a victim. That's why you don't see the traditional attackers showing up at the police station to commit these attacks because they know they're going to have a fight. And so they pick locations that they perceive people will not fight back. And they, they are, in other words, they're counting on you to be a good little victim for them and behave like a victim for them. So if we know this uh, going into it, now we know if we don't have a choice, that's part of the reason we advocate if you don't have a choice, it's time to fight. It's not time to beg for your life or cower underneath the table, things of that nature. And statistically, you will see that fighting back significantly increases your chances of living and uh, surviving the attack or prevailing is what we like to say in the attack without greater harm than you would have had if you just uh, begged, for your li begged for your life. Now the reason we talk about begging for your life is not going to work is this. Now that you understand the worldview of these traditional attackers, I want you to think about it from their perspective. When they show up in the room that you're in and you're underneath the table begging for your life, what are you doing now? You're now giving them visual confirmation that they are the victimizer and they're successfully transitioning from victim to victimizer. How do they know this? Because you're the one acting like a victim begging for your life. And what you've in fact done is you've made it worse and you've, you're actually feeding the frenzy because you're getting them visual confirmation that they are successfully transitioning from victim to victimizer. So uh, as far as how we're going to respond, what are the strategies for responding to an armed intruder or to an active threat? Uh, one of the things we'd like to say. We teach what we call a three out approach. This three out approach can be summarized this way, lock out, get out, and take out not necessarily in that order. In other words, any one of those three outs could end up being your first out. So uh, for example, the room you find yourself in now, uh, maybe it's a big room with two entries and two exits. Uh, whatever door you're the closest to, maybe you're ne sitting next to the uh, one, one particular entrance, if he comes in that room, you can't lock out obviously, and you can't get out, you can run, but you'll just die tired. So now this will be a case if you're right, if the attacker's right on top of you, it's time to fight. It's time to take out, in other words. Now, if you find yourself next to an in, uh, entrance or exit and the attacker comes in the other door that's way across the other side of the room, well, that would be an applicable time to get out. And we may try to get out of that area to a room that we can lock out to prevent access to the intruder. So in other words, this is not a linear approach. This is not a linear model, meaning you're going to do these outs or any model in any particular order. What we've seen in the past is some of these other models, I'll, I'll use run, hide, fight, for instance. That was designed and many times it's taught as a linear approach, meaning you always run away from the threat. Second, you then hide it if, if you can't run away from the threat. And then third, if that doesn't work, you fight. Well, the problem with a linear approach is in real life, we have proved a linear model is not going to be very effective. I'll give you a quick example. Ohio State University, November of 2016, we had a terrorist that showed up on campus began to run over people with a vehicle outside of buildings, ran, running over people with his vehicle on sidewalks and on streets. Uh, he then wrecked his vehicle. He got out and began to stab people outside the building. Ohio State University had the run, hide, fight model, uh, the linear approach. They put out that mass notification, everybody implement the run, hide, fight model. Well, the first step of run, hide, fight based on a linear approach is to run away. Well, what happened in that case is we had people that were inside of buildings and guess what happened? Yes. They ran outside, outside of the building. And in fact, were putting themselves in greater danger by leaving a secure building to go outside. So that linear approach in that case, we've seen it in several other cases, is not going to be nearly as effective as a nonlinear model. So that's why we teach uh, based on nonlinear. The next thing I want to talk to you about is this idea of doing a personal three out assessment. No matter where you find yourself day to day, this is a principally based approach, by the way. It doesn't just apply when you're at work. It will apply no matter where you find yourself, the fast food restaurant, the place of worship, the movie theater. Uh, no matter where you find yourself, this three out approach will work. Now, uh, what we advocate is you do a personal three out assessment. Teach your family how to do a personal three out assessment, your coworkers. And how do we do a three out assessment? Well, it's this way. You ask yourself three questions. How could I lock out the area I'm in? How could I get out? What are my avenues of escape based on the area I'm in? And then the third is take out. What do I have on me or around me that I can fight back with? If God forbid the attacker's right here, right now, I've got to be able to uh, transition to fighting very quickly. Because what I'm trying to do, remember, he's trying to transition from victim to victimizer. What I'm trying to do is push him back into the victim category. 
Remember, he's planning on you acting like a good, good little victim. And when you don't, it's really going to surprise him. He's not behaviorally preconditioned to, for the fight. And he's going to be surprised when the fight takes place. So we're trying to push him back into the victim category. So that personal three-out assessment, you can do that in about 30 seconds, no matter where you find yourself from day to day. For instance, the fast food restaurant, you might find yourself positioned next to an exit door. There's multiple entrances and exits in most fast food restaurants. If he comes across that, or comes in the, the entrance across the way, well, I know I can get out this door that's right next to me. Uh, if he comes in the entrance that's right next to me, I know I have to take out. I have to fight first in that particular instance. So going through those three outs, asking myself those three, out, those three questions, how could I lock out, how could I get out, how could I take out, I can do, have that assessment complete in about 30 seconds, no matter where I find myself from day to day. So it's just a new way of, of thinking. Okay, so we, again, we talk about this nonlinear approach. It's not lock out, get out, take out in that order. In other words, my out may not necessarily be your out. Uh, it, my out may be completely different, even though you're only 20, 25 feet away from me, uh, it may be completely different than the out you choose to recommend. So we, we want to advocate to you on which out is proper and when that uh, and applicable based on uh, the threat location and based on the environment you find yourself in. So in other words, let's just talk about lockout first. Lockout is generally appropriate when I'm in an area that can't be locked out. And if you find yourself <coughs> in our in-person training and in our uh, e-learning courses, uh, we actually show you, even if you find yourself in an office that doesn't have a lock, uh, we teach you some gross motor skill strategies and techniques, how you can secure that door regardless if that door opens into the room or if it opens out of the room, uh, some strategies and techniques where you can secure that door even if it does not have a lock. But lockout is usually appropriate when we're in an area that can be locked out and the intruder is not in that area with me. So that's when lockout would be appropriate. Get out, when is get out appropriate? Well, if you're in an area that can't be locked out, uh, we got to get out of that area to an area that we can lock out. Now, if we find ourselves next to an exit door uh, specifically, we can get out of the building altogether. Get out would not be appropriate in the case where maybe you find yourself on the third floor and you got to go down four hallways, two flights of stairs to get to the exit door. Well, the downside of implementing get out in that case is you may come across the attacker during that, that route, that long route of getting out of the building. So in that case, you'd be better off getting out of that, maybe that's a cubicle farm uh, that you find yourself, those cube areas. Uh, get out of that cubicle area to a room that's close to you that you've pre-identified in your three out assessment that you can lock out. So in that case, you'd be get out to lock out. And then of course, take out is appropriate when we have no other choice. It may be your first option. It may be your only option. Uh, so uh, it, even though it's a last resort, it could be your first option or only option. Uh, so when the attacker is, is in close proximity to you and you don't have the ability to get out of that area, it's time to fight. And uh, the good news is one, two, or three of you that are willing to fight for your life, that's a formidable force. And, uh, and it's going to be a very, uh, much of a surprise for the attacker when we talk about this idea of taking out or fighting back. Now, again, I want to emphasize and I want to tell you that takeout is a last resort. We're not going to John Wayne it. We're not going to, even if we may find ourselves in a locked out room that we've locked, layered, and reinforced, we're not going to leave that secure area and, and go fight if we don't have to. So it is a last resort. Again, it could be your, your first option. So when we talk about taking out or fighting back, I want you to think about those items on you or around you that you can take out or fight back with. Uh, now, when we f talk about using force against the attacker, I want you to think back to your physics class, and I want you to think back to what is the formula for force. And if you th can think back that far, some of you this may be easier than others, uh, think about that formula for force. It's mass times acceleration or mass times velocity. So even though we may have a big, a big object that we can fight with, has great mass, guess what we can't get with it? We can't get velocity with that object. So uh, it may not be the best object to fight back with. So we want that object that we can combine uh, good mass with velocity. Uh, those objects that are around you uh, might be a three-hole punch or a stapler or a, a tape dispenser. Uh, your cell phone many times is a good, and people are like, oh, I don't want to use my cell phone. Uh, that one might break it. Well, hey, uh, we've got to remember the crisis we're in. Hey, we can fix that. That's what insurance is for on our cell phones. But it's a good object to fight back with. Scissors that you find around your table might be a good object to fight with. Uh, as well. So be thinking about those objects on you or around you in your work area uh, that we can fight back with. Two or three of you that are willing to fight for your life, that's a formidable force. And even those objects that would not be good to, to, if we didn't have time, even an empty water bottle or a partially empty water bottle, throw it at them. 
And why would that be effective and better than nothing? Is because when that object's flying through the air at the attacker, he doesn't have time to determine, I wonder if that's going to hurt when it gets here. He's going to duck or flinch and try to avoid that object because he doesn't have time to determine, is it going to hurt if it's flying towards his head? So I want you to think about that. The next thing we want to talk about is this mindset for fighting back. Now, if you go out to YouTube, you will notice there's a lot of, quote, training videos out there on how to respond to an active threat or an active shooter. And most of them and many of them have the title, Survive the Active Shooter. Well, survival creates the, if we have a survival mindset, it creates the wrong mindset. You can do everything wrong and still survive, okay? And survival is more of a defensive mindset. When we talk about fighting back, we want to have an offensive mindset. In fact, we talk about this phrase self-defense. I'm not a big fan of the phrase self-defense. Uh, to me, self-defense means getting beat slowly, uh, and it's a defensive mindset. Uh, winning requires offense. A football team that's always on defense is going to lose. Uh, uh, they need to be on offense some too in order to win. So instead of talking about this idea of surviving, what we say is uh, we want to prevail. And uh, I mean, prevail is a completely different mindset than surviving. It's offensive. It means I win. Uh, so what does prevailing mean to me personally uh, in this particular topic or this particular crisis? Well, prevailing personally to me means I'm going home with the same amount of holes I came with. That's what prevailing means to me, and that may mean something different to you, but just overall what we're talking about is being proactive or being offensive versus defensive. And we talk about fighting back. I want you to think about uh, this idea of fighting back. Uh, I tell my wife, now if somebody comes up and asks for your purse or your wallet, of course you're going to give it to them because you can take yourself out of danger by giving them what they want. But when we talk about an active threat event like this particular event we're talking about today, uh, remember, you can't beg your way out of it. So it's going to require you to participate in your own outcome. And I'll tell you the same thing. If somebody's trying to hurt you, trying to harm you, I'll tell you the same thing I tell my wife. You may get beat, but by gosh, you better get beat doing something. Okay, don't get beat doing nothing underneath the table begging for your life in the fetal position. Absent training, people getting in the fetal position is a very common thing to do. Okay, so I want you to think about that uh, absent training. It's not the right thing to do, though, however. Many people have lost their lives in these events uh, in the fetal position begging for their life. That's not the right thing to do, and it's a very instinctual or natural response, but it's not the right response. So I want you to think about that. Okay, the next thing I want you to consider, and this is more towards uh, the end of the response phase and towards the beginning of the recovery phase, is what do you need to know as far as what to do when law enforcement gets there? Well, I want to summarize this slide that you see here. And if we summarize this slide, it's this right here. Really, all law enforcement wants to see when they come across you in that particular building. Now, I want you to think about it from their perspective. They don't know if you're a good guy or a bad guy. And they have to make a whole lot of decisions in a very short time frame. These decisions they're having to make, life and death decisions, they're having to make in time-compressed environments, very split-second decisions. So I want you to think about it from their perspective. Really, all law enforcement needs to see or needs to hear from you when they come across you is all they need to see is empty hands. Show them your empty hands is what, we're tr what we need to do. Don't be reaching for your wallet and saying, oh, thank God, officer, I know you're here. Let me get my ID for you. Uh, it looks like when you're reaching for your wallet, you might be going for a weapon, and you could end up being a victim of friendly fire, and we know of friendly fire is never friendly. Uh, so uh, don't be reaching for your wallet or anything like that. Sh try to stay as calm as you can. Show those, that officer your empty hands and follow their directions. They may be yelling at you. Don't take it personal if they're yelling. Uh, they're just trying to get compliance very quickly because they're trying to find out who the bad guy is so they can de-escalate uh, this attack and neutralize the attacker very quickly. So now remember, at the end of this presentation, you're going to see our contact information. If you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, email us. We'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, how can we help you? How can we serve you? Well, first of all, Make sure you've had this discussion with your insurance company ahead of time. Guide one, uh, they, they can help get you the solutions you need. And uh, on this particular topic, workplace violence, uh, we're blessed to partner with them on, uh, on uh, this, uh, lots of different security-related topics. And uh, between them or us, we can certainly get you the answers and the solutions you need. And we, remember, we want to implement those solutions before the crisis. The time of the crisis is not to prepare. Uh, so uh, we want to talk about this ahead of time. Uh, how else can we help you? Well, we usually provide clients solutions in three phases, okay? And uh, when we talk about the ability to demonstrate due diligence preparedness we talked about earlier post-event, it's this idea of 
you as the organization, have you taken a reasonable effort to prevent harm? Well, this three-pronged strategy we, re we recommend is first doing a risk assessment on your facility, a physical security risk assessment. We can do that for you. Uh, we come in, we look at your things like access control, we look at credential management, how is our employees credentialed, are they wearing their credentials, so that if we come across somebody not with uh, employee credentials, we can ask them uh, if they can, we can help them find the location we're at, have they checked in. We can also help you with your visitor management practices, uh, how we uh, admitting people into our building, visitors or vendors, things of that, uh, things of that nature. We can also assist you during the physical security assessment with safe room identification. Identifying those safe rooms in each work area, each floor, uh, ahead of time that people know that that is a safe room and employees know that's where I'm going to go if I have time uh, to, to uh, secure myself into and, and to, again to lock out that area and we want to set up those rooms as safe rooms ahead of time. Phase two. Phase two is putting a written plan together. Workplace violence program manual. Now most organizations will claim that they have a workplace violence program or plan. Um, what we find is most of them do not. Usually, if they have anything at all, it's usually a one-page policy, and it's a policy on no bullying, no harassment, uh, and no tolerance. Uh, it's not a true comprehensive workplace violence program and program manual. A comprehensive workplace violence program should include domestic violence policy. How are we going to educate people on the importance of reporting if they're a victim of domestic violence, if they have a protection order in place against a significant other, so we can put plans in place. Also, having a high-risk termination policy. First of all, how is it that policy will outline what is a high-risk termination? Is this particular termination we're going to be doing today, is it a high-risk termination? We want to be able to do that and define that objectively. Usually what happens in high-risk terminations is uh, they do it subjectively, meaning well, they, we don't have any behavior this person engaged in that we can define. So instead, because we don't have a policy, they say, I just got a bad feeling about this person. This, this is going to be a high-risk termination. No, the high-risk termination policy will help you outline criteria. It also help you outline the, the process for how we're going to perform that process or that termination. Who's going to be present? Where it's going to take place? How we can protect the dignity and self-respect of that person so that the situation isn't worse if it does fall into high-risk category? Uh, the next is, do we have an intruder response policy that includes safe room identification and educates people how they're going to respond? Uh, a reporting and intervention policy. We know that most bad acts are preceded by bad behavior. So we want to educate our employees and our leadership on what are the behavior indicators, uh, the body language indicators of people that are escalating towards violence. It's very rarely are these sudden and impulsive acts. So if we can uh, obviously be much better to prevent an incident from occurring before it got to the point that we're having to respond to it, which is primarily what we focused on today. And then the second is, what is the employee's perception to hazards within the workplace? We can learn from employees. Maybe we have solutions in place that they simply are not aware of. So we want to educate them. So all these things go into your workplace violence program manual that we can help you with. And then the third is the training phase. And the training phase, we've been doing some training today, but there's really no substitute for comprehensive training. And uh, in-person training is usually what we recommend. Uh, for foundational training. Uh, we come to you, we do the in-person training at your organization. Usually we can do that in a two-hour course for employees and then we also have a four-hour course for management and leadership as well uh, that we can educate management and leadership on the four-hour course and then the two-hour course for employees. So that's really the three-pronged uh, strategy for being able to demonstrate to, uh, due diligence preparedness. Now remember, I want to turn this back over to Guide 1, but we're super excited to partner with Guide 1 on this topic today. We hope everything you learn is a complete waste of time and it's not needed, but God forbid if it is needed, uh, you will now have a really strong head start on most everybody else on how to respond to this incident. Remember, get a hold of us if you have any questions. We'll be happy to answer your questions. We've got our contact information listed on this slide here.